Okay, so this morning when I was, I was driving in, on the back of this truck in front of us, it said, this is Ghost Rider requesting a flyby. <laughs> what does that mean when I say that? Where did that come from? Top Gun. Top Gun, all right, good, perfect. Has anyone not heard that? Does anyone have no idea what I'm talking about when I say that quote? Okay, good. So that's, this is a perfect example of what I want to talk about right now because the Bible is full of these pop cultural, um, these lines, these statements, these stories that were passed around for quite a while. And the New Testament is full of them. And not only is the New Testament full of them, it leverages them and even tells stories um, that are, in my, my belief, a midrash. And a lot of you know who, what a midrash is, and I know some of you are very familiar with midrash. So I'm going to go through and kind of explain what it is just for those who are online or those who may not be familiar with it. And I want to start off using more of these, these quotes. So you guess the movie. I'm just going to throw these up here. We'll go quick. There's no place like home. Wizard of Oz. Some form of this. I have a bad feeling about this. Star Wars. Right. Has everyone seen The Princess Bride? Okay. Right? So, and there might be one more here. Hold on. Okay, no, that was it. All right, so if I were to say inconceivable in some kind of form like the movie and you hadn't had any experience to watch that movie, it would make no sense to you. But if you have seen that movie, you just imported two hours, and everyone's smiling because it's a great movie. It's a funny movie. You've just imported two hours of content and because of that word, Right? That's what Midrash, that's the power of Midrash, and that's what we see in the Bible. So what is it? Let's get a formal definition here. It comes from the word for digging or searching. Um, and I've had this slide up here before, but it's just a good reminder. It's also what we use for drash, a sermon. It's homiletic storytelling. It's a way of understanding the Bible, the more challenging parts, and what that means to us today. So in the case of Peter's drash, we're not... You know, we're not priests, we're not Levites, not all of us, but that's how you take drash and you make that part of our world today. It's similar to movie quotes. If you are familiar with the drash, you will land on the appropriate understanding that the teacher wanted you to have. If you're not familiar with the drash, and we will see this today and in the coming weeks, we're going to ease in, but today you'll see a good example. If you're not familiar with that quote, or that midrashic background, you can actually get to the opposite answer, the opposite conclusion of what that teacher was trying to teach you. And it's catastrophic in the New Testament, and I'll show you how we get there through that. Um, it's based on a gap in the text or a word play or something happened too quickly. There was an abrupt change. The Bible didn't exactly explain. So enter midrash to explain that. And then probably most importantly, it's living, breathing. It challenges us. You can create new midrash. You can drash on this material even today. There might be a new way of looking at the text. They generally fall into, we'll call it two categories. There might be some in between. Agadic, which are stories and homilies. And that's basically most of what we know about the characters of the Bible that isn't in the Bible itself, right? Um, Aaron said a few weeks ago, Abraham smashed the idols. It's not in the Bible, but it's a very popular midrash about Abraham's um, monotheism even as a child. And then there's halakhic midrash, and that explains, okay, the Bible didn't necessarily say how we're supposed to handle this, this mitzvah, but here's what we can learn from the stories and, and the teachings of the sages. Because there are gaps. There are places where the, you know, what happens when you have a holiday that falls on Shabbat? Who lights, which, do you light the candles or do you not light the candles? Do you light them first or do you, right? You need background for that. Beautifully. A friend of mine sent me this this week. Midrash Rabbah is now being commissioned, and a lot of it is available in English on safaria.org. This was not the case up until very recently. So now, I, I, when I made this a few weeks ago, I was going to tell you we have it back here. We still do. You just talk with Danny if you want to borrow a lot of the Midrash. But now you should be able to find a lot of it on safaria.org. That's an amazing, well-timed um, gift to, to the world. Oh, let me just show you real quick. So what you'll see, though, it has the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, Song of Songs, which I did a few weeks ago. If you remember, I walked through that Midrash in the New Testament using Song of Songs and Esther Rabbah. Ruth Rabbah, 
Kohelet and Eichat. They're all there and they're amazing. You'll see so much. And it's a really expensive collection if you want to buy it. It's worth it, but now you don't have to. You can preview it. This is another slide we've looked at before. This is how we kind of categorize the ways we're looking at the Torah or any uh, scripture for that matter. Pishat is the plain meaning. Obviously, it's the historical, um, the literal meaning. What's the, the plain sense of this word? Remez is a lot of the prophetic. And Drash is where we're going to focus today. Although a lot of the New Testament has all of these together. And sometimes these are fused, the secret, the soul, the mystical with the drash. And that's the, the um, acronym Pardes, paradise. So you might see in the Talmud that the sages went into the orchard, which is the same word for paradise. Um, on the plain sense, it could mean they went into an orchard. On a different read, it went into some, they went into some kind of a study of the Torah or a meditation on scripture. And What's important to know is all of these are in the New Testament, which dramatically changes how we read the New Testament because a lot of people look at that and that's all they look at. And they might dabble in, in Remez kind of without any idea of, of the rules, but that's where they stay. So when we know this, we realize something very big in the New Testament. It applies a different rule or perspective to the text, right? So when you enter the world of Drash, the rules of understanding it in the plain sense are no longer applicable to the same degree. Now you're in new territory. And the same with the other levels. Again, it's all throughout the New Testament. But here's what I want you to walk away with today. For God. Yeah, just an important thought. Um, a lot of times people jump straight to so de remez, but without mastering the shot, you cannot move on. It's yeah. like you've got to know the rules. You have to understand what the reality of the situation is, and only then you can jump to the next level. A lot of people want to basically get buff without exercising, yeah. get all the results, all the benefits, all the goodies without having to put in the work of actually understanding what the text says. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point to pause on, because in, in, you may disagree, but in, in my opinion, in my observation, the church jumps straight to a different level without fully understanding, I say the church very broadly, without fully understanding the, the Peshat or the levels and how you, how you shift that framework. It's almost like all of the Torah got compressed into the Peshat and you have a lot of problems because the concept of Messiah is not actually Peshat. You'll have a hard time finding the concept of Messiah in the plain reading, but you can find it in the Drash, the Remez, and the Sword. Yeah, I think it's a, a, lot of the, a lot of the interesting parts of the Tanakh, for example, like Messianism or the Resurrection, are not plain. I mean, the, the Sadducees kind of had it right. They were sort of, they were sort of a Peshat reading, you know, in, in so many ways. It was those, it was those quote-unquote liberal um, Pharisees that would, that would run off with the text and, and that actually, that actually kind of saw those glimmers of a Messianic eon or a Resurrection. And, and so it's like, well, the Sadducees were very sola scriptura, you know, yes. so you couldn't, you couldn't really, yeah. That's a brilliant point, and the Talmud reflects that. The, the Sadducees are always hurling questions at the Pharisees. Tell us where you see this resurrection of the dead in, in the Bible, because we don't, we don't see it. And the, the Pharisees have a, a way of reading it, not the Peshat. They read it in the, the um, Remez or, or, or Drash, and that's how they get it. And, of course, the Sadducees don't like that because, as Drake said, they're purists. Well, yeah, I mean, like... like um, we, God introduced himself to Moshe as the God of, you know, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's not the God of the dead. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, there must be a resurrection. So it's like, it, it's, it could be viewed as playing fast and loose with the text. But nevertheless, like, all the dogmas of today were once those wild and freewheeling, um, um, I guess, forays back then. You know, yeah. it's funny. Yeah, these are really good points. These would be um, possibly good topics for, for Shavuot, actually. This is what I want you to walk away with. We're going to go through a couple of these. I'm going to try to keep it moving. Just kind of let all of this pass over you. And if you have any interest in this, come back to the video. Or just kind of stay loosely engaged. But this is what's important. Not only does Midrash demonstrate the reliance and the application of the Jewish oral tradition among Yeshua and the apostles. In some cases, it's the earliest written recording of these Midrashic stories, which are now printed. They weren't printed at that time, obviously. 
Sometimes it's the, er the New Testament is the earliest we have of it. So it shows this continuous thread of these teachings. Just, just highlight for people the, the dating of the Midrash Rabbah, for example. This, the collection itself is quite late, some of it. Yeah, um, centuries later, 500, 700. Some of these Midrash were, were gathered and compiled. But you have to remember, they were gathered and compiled in a context, just like a, a Bible canon happens in a context. This is centuries after the oral era. This is after the Mishnah was written. New Testament's already, there. New Testament's already written. But what it shows is, and now you have to remember too, the Midrash, there might have been other Midrash we just don't have access to anymore. It was oral. They may have had more <laughs> nuance in some of the stories, but the way they were gathered and compiled have a certain bias to them. Regardless of that, um, it still shows continuity in some amazing ways with the New Testament. But it moves that needle all the way back to the time of Yeshua, the first century. Now, most people wouldn't argue that that Midrash goes way back further, right? It, some people would. I mean, yes, there's a world out there who would reject everything I'm saying today. But a lot of scholars recognize that that oral tradition goes quite a long ways back, and we'll never really have an idea of where it started. That's kind of the rub. Okay, so earliest written recording of these Midrash can often be found in the New Testament. So here we go. Yannis and Yamaris. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, just as Yannis and Yamaris opposed Moses, so these men, whoever the men were he was talking about, uh, are, they oppose the truth. They're corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. Now, where do we read about these two, Yannis and Yamaris in the Bible? Hmm? Where in the Bible, though? Depends on what you consider to be the Bible. <laughs> Right, great question. It's in the book of Jasher. Okay, yeah, that's it. It's in Jasher. Um, spoiler alert, it's not in the Bible. So when Paul was writing this, it seems as if he, he understood that his audience knew who these two were. But it's not in the New Testament other than this passage. And it's not in the Old. Hmm? Um, yeah, so uh, it's in the Targum. I have a couple here. It's, it's, it, these two are named, actually, in a lot of different places. I just grabbed a few from my notes for this purpose. You'll see them quite often in the Midrash. Um, the anger of the Lord was provoked because he, because he would go curse them, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way to be an adversary to him. This is talking about Bilam. But he, Bilam, sat upon his donkey, and his two young sons, Yanis and Yamaris, were with him. So the Targum says that these two are the sons of Bilam, so they're already in bad company. Um, this is when Moshe is up on the mountain. He's receiving the Torah. There were some troublemakers while Moshe, Moses was delayed six hours, it says. Um, two, the two particular troublemakers were Egyptians named Yanis and Yamaris, who were Pharaoh's magicians. They were the ones um, creating lice when Moses created lice. You always wonder, like, who would do that? And these two would do that. <laughs> yes. Serpent ate the serpent. Yep. That's yeah, not a midrash. Yeah, midrash. And again, so this is in, this is in, again, these are everywhere. You'll find it in here if you read on that passage. If you read on the passage of the um, Moshe having that um, battle with the, with the uh, what do you call them, magicians, you'll see the midrash talks about these two. So here's what we know. Now we know what Paul is talking about in the book of Timothy. Who were these two? They were the sons of Balaam. They were magicians in Pharaoh's court. They followed Israel out of Egypt, probably for no, no good reason. They opposed Moses many times, and they instigated the sin of the golden calf. This is all from the Midrash. But Paul assumes we know that, or at least assumes Timothy knows that. That's strange, though, if you figure it's not in the Bible, right? That already opens us up to some new territory. Does that make sense? Okay. This is the game we're playing here. We're going we're gonna to kind of pull these together. Some of these are my own... Um, but I encourage you to look into those. I just encourage everyone to think about the process of canonization. Uh, a lot of times people think that like the Bible we have is something that people have always had. Actually, the process was very, very loose. It didn't happen. Different groups of people considered certain books to be you know, nice and readable and profitable for teaching and learning. Others considered other groups. So, so within Judaism of that day, there were always fractions that liked one book or the other, and many of them leaned upon books beyond what you would consider today canonical. And so they read much bigger and much broader. <coughs> they dipped their toes into a whole library 
that today has been limited and shrunk down to the text that the people said, these are the good ones, stay with these. Mm -hmm. The Ethiopian you, canon is one of the widest. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and if you, if you were reading just what is canonized, and canonized takes on a different definition, whether you're in the Catholic Church or the Protestant, if you're reading just what's canonized, you're missing out on a lot of information that the original audience had. And to your point, Peter, you said um, around the time of Hanukkah, um, the Maccabees story may have made it in, but politically it couldn't because of Hasmoneans at that time. They had already kind of been corrupted. So, yeah, canon happens and it's political, but you have to know his original audiences, they had a lot more to read. And they, even the Gentiles in Paul's audience had a lot more knowledge than most people do today. Because they shut up the That's right. Teaching hour. <laughs> Teaching hour. <laughs> Um, all right, so here we go. Washing of feet, very popular um, among the church. It, it's happening here around um, in the Gospels, and I'll show you. But first, I'm going to go back. You could go back to Abraham, but in the Midrashic tradition, there's a better connection here with Joseph. So um, Joseph frames his brothers. He sends them back. He keeps Simeon, Shimon, in jail. And then he says, come on back with your brother Benjamin. They bring Benjamin back. Joseph takes Simeon out of jail, out to them. And when the man had <coughs> brought the men into Joseph's house and, and given them water, they washed their feet. Now, this banquet in the Bible is just a dinner. It's just a dinner between Joseph and his, um, his brothers, who don't know he's um, Joseph yet. <coughs> Here are some things in the Midrash, and it's very fascinating. It's only a chapter or so that you would have to read to gather this, but you'll see it. In the Midrash... The passages in the Bible about the banquet contain the word cup, kos, four times. So a Passover Seder has four cups. Even though we know this is way before the Passover Seder was instituted, the rabbis see that there are four cups mentioned in this banquet. So the sages say, oh, this is a Passover Seder. This is an allusion to the Passover Seder. And everything they talk about with Joseph and his brothers is in relation to a Seder. We learn that Joseph doesn't drink wine until he's reunited with his brothers. I won't drink of this wine, right? So you have, you're starting to see these ideas. The brothers are together. They don't quite know who this guy is. He didn't drink alcohol until he's reunited with them. Well, he won't drink until he's reunited with them. And then Joseph washes Shimon. This is where it's fascinating, right? I'm just picking one dart out of this whole tradition. It's very deep. Before their eyes, Joseph imprisoned Shimon. Once they departed, Joseph gave Shimon food, drink, washed him, and anointed him. So he was kind to his brother, the one who caused the trouble. that got him pretty much thrown in the pit. The commentary, the art scroll commentary, Joseph resorted to the expedient showering of Shimon with benevolence. He waited on him hand and foot. So we're getting this idea, hand and feet, right? Where he's, he's washing him. He's, he's doing something. He's humbling himself. He's, the, he's like the vice regent of Egypt. He's humbling himself for Shimon. Now, if you remember, Peter's name is Shimon, Shimon Kepha. The Gospels make sure that they include that. They don't always, but Simon, Shimon, it's the same word. Then he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Shimon, Peter, and said, <clears throat> who said to him, Lord, why do you wash my feet? So we're seeing at the Passover, we're seeing the same the image of the wine, the brothers being together, the kingdom, um, and the washing of Shimon's feet. So you have to say, did it? What, did one happen or did the other happen? Or is, is the author trying to bring a story together so you see the connections and the deeper connections? Uh, Rabbi Foreman refers to those intertextualities. Intertextualities? Yeah, so hyperlinks within the text. They're, 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 like that. Same verbiage, same language in one part is a way of casting commentary on another book. Yeah, I think at this point we shouldn't be concerned about the validity of the New Testament. I think we need to step back and look, that, look and see that the authors are connecting stories and people. And we know Joseph and Yeshua have an incredible amount in common. This would be a teaching on its own. Um, you know, fathers, you know, it, it, I don't want to get into that now. It'll take me off course and I know that time is ticking. But you get my point. The author is trying to bring these stories together and these people together to show you on a Midrashic level, maybe even on a Sog level, that there's more going on here than just a Passover Seder. 
All right, there's a humbling, there's a rectification, there's a tikkun, there's a... Um, it's very deep. I encourage you to jump into that. And I have the notes if you have questions on where to start. This is a good one. And we said this this morning, actually, um, opening the service. A dot or a yod? Since you're familiar with it, we'll just read the highlighted parts. Yeshua's teaching, and he says, don't think, don't even think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come but to fulfill, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. We know that passage very well. We probably all had to argue that with somebody at some point to get to this room. We probably had to argue with ourselves to get to this room. So how have you heard, wrong answers only, this passage explained before? What does he mean when he says, I have not come to abolish, I've come to fulfill? Great. I, th I think in the common lexicon, fulfill just means to abolish in a nice way on the up and up, above board. And so it's like, a, like and I think their timeline is, well, the cross happened and the resurrection of the, of the Messiah happened, and that's the fulfillment. Not, you know, in, in Revelation, it actually used the word geno, uh, genomai in, in Greek to accomplish, uh, which appears again in Revelation. And so it's giving you an idea more of the distance from that accomplished yeah. than, than I think is the common understanding. And so, um, but yeah, that's just... So I didn't come to abolish it, but I kind of abolished it. In a nice, nice way. Yeah. I'm still giving Moses good credit, and you know, I'm doing it on the up and up, and, but I'm just going to let it gracefully disintegrate and go back into the annals of history and, and the yeah. church replace it. And all that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I love that <coughs> explanation. Um, but way, the way I've typically heard it explained um, is less graceful than... What Greg says, but typically though, people will say that it's been filled, fulfilled to such an extent that we no longer need to keep it. Right. Which essentially is, it's been abolished. Right. It's a nice way of saying what Drake said. It's just a nice way around to get to the same conclusion. I heard it basically the same, but the word completed instead of yes. Yep. Fulfilled, and you say, and since it's completed, it's done. We don't have to do it anymore. Yes. Yeah. You know, just. Just a logical argument. It would be like someone keeping the laws of traffic and then everyone's exonerated from keeping any laws of traffic because Drake did it. He, he kept all the laws perfectly last Saturday. Right? It's chaos. We know that it's chaos. And we know that he didn't say that, so we have to, we have to come up with a reason why it doesn't mean that. I, think. I was going to say, um, I love the commentary in the daily translation from FFOZ where they talk about this very word. <clears throat> they translate it uh, into Hebrew, not as lemale, which would mean to fulfill, but rather lehakim, which means to establish, yeah. to make firm. And I think that's the better translation. Yeah, and this is what I find fascinating because I've looked at this many times too. I've had this conversation with many people. We get into the word of what does the Greek say? What the, right? All these translations. I'm going to I'm going to show you something that sweeps all of that away, and we're going to look at a midrash. And this is one of those areas where if you don't know the Midrash, you can arrive at the complete opposite answer. All right. So the commandment that we're going to be talking about, um, and I want to show you this because it'll be part of this Midrash. Um, you're not allowed to multiply wives for yourself. The king can't. But if you remove this Yod, the tiniest letter, it might even be tinier in some fonts, you get the word Rabah, which means great. Like think of the Erev Rav. Rav, Rabah, it's a sit in bet in the vet. Um, the mixed multitude. So it's a multitude. So it's many. It's creating more, right? It's this active. Yeah, it, it, like, what's that? That's right. So if you remove the Yod, the rabbis say, you're creating, you're, this, this is almost like a stopper in, in the way that they play with the text. Now you're creating more. You're, 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 you're expanding. You're multiplying. Here is the Midrash that was missing. Solomon arose and studied the reasons of God's decree, and he said, why did God command that we shall not multiply wives to himself? Is it because his heart will turn them away? Well, I will multiply, and still my heart won't turn away. So he says, I, I don't need that law. I'm going to multiply wives, and my heart won't turn away. Again, this is the Midrash. Our sages said at that time the Yod of the word Yarbe went up on high and prostrated itself before God and said, Master of the universe, have you seen... Uh, you said that no letter will ever be abolished from the Torah. Behold, Solomon has now arisen and abolished one. 
Who knows, today he abolishes one letter, tomorrow he will abolish another, until the whole Torah is nullified. God says, Solomon and a thousand like him will pass away, but the smallest dot will not be erased from you. That's pretty much the answer. That's the missing key. Yeshua is quoting an earlier Midrash. Exodus Rabbah has done the, the job of writing it down for us, but it seems to have been a teaching from before Yeshua. Maybe it goes back to Hillel. I don't know. He sat at the sage's feet in the temple when he was a kid, remember? So that's still... Okay, so we're not going to abolish the Torah. Well, what does that do for the word fulfill? We still have to answer that question, right? There's another Midrash. It's actually in the same section. They're all grouped, right? They're kind of in the same area. Moses said to the Holy One, why are you angry? Is it because your Torah, which today the Israel people have violated? If so, it's my responsibility to ensure that I and my colleagues fulfill it. And the word used, translated out of the Hebrew, is fulfill in the art scroll. And I think it's the same in Sonsino. So uphold and fulfill is the same meaning. Um, I think we're in good territory to say fulfill, but you'll get my point. I and my colleagues will fulfill it. Even if the rest of the people have fulfilled their, have, uh, have fulfilled their obligation, right? Uh, have not fulfilled their obligation. I should have had a nod in there. Aaron and his sons will fulfill it. Joshua and Caleb will fulfill it. Yeah, Aaron and Machir will fulfill it. All other righteous people will fulfill and uphold it. So God, you know, God wants people to keep the Torah. And it seems like a lot of people are falling away and they're not doing it. But the righteous people are saying, even if they do, I'm going to uphold it myself. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fulfill it and keep it. So that, too, is in the Midrash, and it's all in the same ballpark. So this gives us the conclusion. It's not abolished, plus fulfilled equals the Torah endures. And the way we crack that code is through the Midrash, not through the translations, which are semi-subjective, if not entirely. Does that make sense? Or, or just use common sense. <laughs> yeah. Which is a lot to ask, I know. Well, it, the problem is, at this point, we have so many commentaries, authoritative commentaries, that... Um, I looked a bunch up before, and they all said what Drake said. <coughs> you did. Um, so I looked this up years ago as well. And um, so when the, the gospel writers use the term fulfill, how they use it in other places, just FYI, um, when, when uh, Messiah's feet were anointed, it says the smell fulfilled the room. Um, when the boat was overfilled with fish, um, same word, it was fulfilled with fish, and so on. It, um, it just doesn't connotate the end of something. It's just something that happened, and it's to its completion. Yeah, I think it's the word play room. Now that I'm play room. Recalling, yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. Also, if someone's so inclined, you can see how that word is used in many other places, and you can kind of like triangulate a definition. But to know that the Midrash has almost verbatim in there kind of gives you a little bit of insight now to how much the authors and Yeshua knew when they were teaching these things. Just a fun fact. The philosophers, one of the names for God they had was Pleromat, which is, comes from that same verb. To, to fulfill, Plerao. Hmm. Pleromat is that, is, which is the fulfillment. Yeah. That is how they call God. In Greek philosophy, <coughs> Philo, they call God. Amazing. Fullness. Yeah. That's what God's name is. Fullness. Like wholeness, yeah. Wholeness. All of it. All of it. But all of it. That sort of puts us back to that prayer at the in 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 the Siddur when we at the end of the Shimon Ashray is that we call him merciful one because his mercy is never ends. Yeah. We call him the compassionate one because his loving kindness is is never ending. It's fulfilling. It's He's always fullness. his fullness of all things. Right. In all things that we lack, he has no let, no end. Yeah, and in that passage, I know we're always fighting in Messianic terms uh, to argue the point of fulfillment or the yud or dad, the completion. But if we just read the next line that you highlighted, yeah. until. So can we say that all of Torah has been fulfilled at the cross, at the death? You can't. Can we it, say it's having an earth pathway? Right. <laughs> so it, even if you take that passage and you, somebody's arguing, you can, have, can you say that it's been fulfilled? Can you say everything about Torah has been fulfilled? All the prophets, and you can't. So you can th that nullifies the statement before that. Well, not, only, not only that, but in Deuteronomy, Moses calls heaven and earth as the witnesses. 
of the Torah. So until heaven and earth pass away, literally, that wasn't just a poetic flourish. It's like heaven and earth as they exist are the witnesses of Torah. Yeah, you know, it's funny, I didn't plan this, but this actually dovetails into this because there is a separation between <coughs> heaven and earth. There, there are like layers. They're called the worlds, Olam, or the world. And that goes into the, the cosmology of the Jewish mindset. And until, like, it's known that the earthly, the terrestrial, the what we see, the, the mud and, and light of, of our existence, is an outworking of those higher levels. Hebrews kind of lays this out, that this came after the heavens and the earth, the heavens and then the, the ethereal, um, which perfectly <coughs> ties into this, because this is another one of those verses which radically, I don't know how we got there, centuries of not understanding this idea. So I'll start with this. Mark 15, 38 through 39. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that, in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man is the son of God. So the centurion sees from Golgotha, right? he sees the, he sees something just happened in the temple and he saw this man just breathe his last and he saw this connection and he said, this is the son of God. What does it mean when the, the temple curtain or veil has torn? What have we heard? Uh, Christ's death opened the way. You don't need the priests anymore. The, the Holy of Holies is open to all. Blah, blah, blah. You just walk right into the Holy of Holies, which keep, keep that in mind because that's going to come back in a second. Yeah, basically the same thing as that, but like the, the separation when the tearing of the curtain happened, then it's like, oh yeah, just anyone, no Levite, no high priest, like it's not just for them, like anyone can walk into the Holy of Holies and, you know, it's crazy because I used to believe that. <laughs> well, the Hebrew says the opposite, like no, of course we're not talking about the temple on earth, like right. good heavens, you can't do it. So... One of the interpretations I've heard is that it's it's like someone tearing a shirt in grief. God the Father has just lost his son and he's tearing his garments. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think I, th I think the way it's always been framed is that, that the temple was sort of this very narrow spigot through which holiness could come into the world or God's presence, and it was inhibitive. And yeah. so, you know, it, I guess... I guess um, the, the, the death uh, and the crucifixion burst the, the reservoir, so to speak, and, and widened, widened it. And so and it, it's always framed as it was sort of a sort of an estoppel to righteousness, or, or yeah, like, yeah, the temple was. Yeah, very good. That it was also um, <coughs> basically a revealing of the sham of sorts, where they were worshiping as if the ark was in the the Holy of Holies, when it hadn't existed, it, it, it was not to be found since the end of the first temple. So when the second temple was built, they no, or, no longer had the Ark of the off. Covenant, or pardon me. <laughs> Your jig is off. It's like Wizard of Oz, the curtain is open. And it's not there. Yeah, it's like, oh no. <laughs> well, you know, I've never heard that before, but I'm really glad you brought that up, because that's... <laughs> Nehemiah and Ezra really got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so good. These are awesome. These are great, because that, some of these I've never even heard. Here's, here's where we have a problem, though, with a lot of those. There were two veils, yeah. right? Not everyone knows that, by the way. Not everyone knows that. Uh, most people, they don't study the temple. Why would we care about that, right? There is an inner to the Holy of Holies, and there is an outer visible from the outside. Um, and the outer one has a very unique design that will be important for this whole piece. Josephus tells us it was only the first part that was open to our view, meaning... You can't go past, you can see the first curtain, but you can't go into the Holy of Holies. No one could do that. Um, even if that veil had torn, you couldn't see it because it's deep in the temple and there's still a veil and a door on the outside. Before the doors, though, when you look at the temple, so you have the Holy of Holies and you have the outer veil, right? And the doors are here, but the outer veil before it was this huge veil. That's the outer one. And it's a Babylonian tapestry of blue and fine linen. And on it, is a panorama of the entire heavens. So it's a very beautiful tapestry of the galaxy, of, as much as they knew about it. And of course we know that they were very into um, <coughs> astronomy. You had to know when the holidays, in this, right? You had to have some kind of working knowledge of astronomy 
So it's right there on the temple. Doors there. Uh, there's Jewish writings say that the doors would throw open right. regularly, unexpectedly. The doors would just fling open, in addition to the to the veil tearing. Yeah, around this time. Yep, yeah. and the Talmud there's some really good uh, statements that kind of corroborate the historical, the Peshat. But I think that there's a midrashic level to this. Okay, Hebrews also tells us behind the second curtain was a second section called the Most Holy Place. So they kind of have the order different than I'm going to go, but they do recognize that there's a second curtain, yeah. right? It's in Hebrews. Here's what it looks like. According to Rabbeinu Bakya, and I took a lot of time to kind of compress this, and I, I quoted him, <clears throat> but here's what you need to know. Does that have a laser on it? I guess it doesn't matter. I'll just use my finger. Um, so number one is the area behind the curtain. That's the Holy of Holies. No one can go in there except the high priest once, or, like once a year. Um, two, the area in front of the inner dividing curtain. So here's the curtain, and here's the area that is between the Holy of Holies and that out the second veil. Right, right. There's like a, a limitation every time from the courts <laughs> all the way into the Holy of Holies. You lose people that can't go in. And the third section is is around here, right? It's so you have two curtains. I just want to draw that out. The second section is what we're looking at, though. The second curtain. You could see this from Golgotha. You could see this from the surrounding mountains. Um, okay. Golgotha was straight east, so you could look straight in through the, the temple entrance. Right, so you, you could see if, it, it, if something had happened, it's foreseeable that you could have line of sight to it. They all stand for something. Of course, they wouldn't just let it be a building, right? There has to be some symbolism to this. The intersection, section one, is the world of the angels and the world of souls. This is a Rabbeinu Bakya. This is a... Middle Ages, but you'll find traces of this in the earlier sages in the Talmud. Um, the world of the celestial bodies is in here. So interesting. The curtain that has the celestial bodies and the galaxy on it is the section that represents the bodies and the stars and the planets. The terrestrial universe, earth, physicality, all of that stuff is in front here. So do you see what we're doing? The temple was designed when the, dis when the information was given to Moses to create it was a symbol, a microcosm of all of God's creation. And even inside of the temple itself and the tabernacle, it's designed to look like the Garden of Eden. Okay. So here's recapping. The heavens are torn. Centurion saw the outer veil torn from his vantage point. The veil had the heavens on it, so they were literally torn. Um, thus the heavens were torn. The Greek word for torn is schizo. We see the same word in Yeshua's immersion. <laughs> in the book of Mark. So it's a bookend to the book of Mark. Immediately he came up out of the water and he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. So look at it this way. Something happened that was supernatural. Something happened that tore through the veil as they looked at this. All the, the seven heavens are, are usually described as being separated by veils. God's behind a veil. Something the spirit of Messiah that existed from before creation, remember it hovers over the water in the Midrash, the spirit of Messiah cuts through the heavens, cuts through that, that dividing layer and comes into our world and ascends, I'm sorry, descends and becomes um, the spirit that Yeshua takes with him. And it happens at the end of his life when he breathes his last, it goes back through the heavens. It's a Midrash. It, now, did it happen? Sure. Did they use that Midrashic tradition to tell that story and kind of add some emphasis to it? I think they did. And we see this many times. <laughs> I just kind of picked one. I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry lands, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in, and I will fill this house, the temple, with glory. So did we see the nations recognizing this? Did we see the heavens and the earth rocked? What, did it happen at the temple? Yeah, all those pieces are there in the gospel. It's brilliantly written, right? They really beautifully, and it just kind of shows you, now you step back from the New Testament and say, this is totally different than I thought it was. Yeah, Drake? Well, the thing I think is interesting about temples, uh, you know, as, as opposed to synagogues or churches today, was that the way they were constructed, I think, I think the Catholics with their cathedral design actually have some sensibility about it, um, that they were supposed to be sort of the cosmos, in which the, the pageant or the drama would take place of, 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 the, of what was the public belief at the time. And so 
So like in Babylon, for example, they would have giant baths of water representing the seas, or the pillars representing the mountains, or the, you know, and maybe, and so the deity would be enthroned in sort of a microcosm of his, of his uh, cosmic abode. And, and so, so it, it's, I think it's much different than just this is a place where we go to pray and, you know, you can do that anywhere. Um, but the idea that God's presence dwells in a place that, that is as much as possible one-to-one -one with our understanding of reality, as it, as it should be, um, is, is, is much more profound. Yeah. You know? So it's not, just, it's not just a building, in a sense. Like, this is, a, this is not a temple, it can never be one. I like that. I'm not saying this to be cantankerous or anything. I'm just saying the 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 story where it says that he saw that the temple was uh, the it was torn. He didn't necessarily have to see it, but it's it's a storytelling technique. Sure. Like in in um, Return of the Jedi, at the end, um, Luke sees somehow that the Death Star is destroyed, and so do the Ewok and every every creature in that realm. There's no way that they could actually see it, yeah. but the storytelling makes it look like they did, okay? Yeah. And the way that I see it, it's kind of like a, um, you know, Hashem doing a deus ex machina or a bot kol, you know, in a written form, yeah. so that we can see it, you know, like it would be done in a play. I agree with you 100%. It had to be a loud sound when it was torn. Yeah, I, I think um, what you're saying, Danny, is, is where I am. I'm kind of stepping back to the, I'm not looking at it from the Peshat level, where that would be a factor. That would surely be a big deal. I think something did happen on the Peshat, the plain historical level. But I'm with you in the sense that the author, from like a meta-narrative, is stringing pieces together to tell a story that we had a high priest who passed through the heavens, as it says in Hebrew, like something supernatural happened that, like, never mind the physical, great, we can, I hope we find something that proves that. But I think the author is saying something bigger that has a more um, cosmological, mystical um, implication to it. Yeah, the storytelling is a little bit more complicated because remember, they're drawing all these traditions and they're not thinking that they're recording history because we modern people <laughs> think of stories as if these are news briefs. Witnessed by eyewitnesses, and, and, and they have their references all lined up. But that's not how storytelling works in the ancient world. He says that so-and-so said this. Well, they could have said something similar to that or close to that. They saw it. Well, maybe they what, what he saw is the heavens torn up, and he saw this cataclysmic event in the heavens, and the darkness falls, and he says that was the sun again. But then he takes then the author, the writer of the story, who tells the story, takes that and combines it with something else that he perceives and he adds to the story a little bit, which is perfectly allowable in the storytelling technique of that day, which today we would sanction journalists for that kind of stuff. But see, in, in that Gospels, time, that was normal. We see, in the Gospels, there's variation. They also we saw the same, same things play out. They told it differently. Right. They all tell the same story. Right. They all have a different focal point. But I think that alone, that what, what Peter just said, is, is huge. People don't read the New Testament that way. They look at it from a from a single, singular level, and all of these bits and pieces. I mean, I, I have thoughts on that. So let me do this. I have. Can I have five more minutes? I have one more. Yeah, we good? Okay, because I don't know what time I'm supposed to end here. Um, Dave is not here, so I'm going to jump in. Where is the day done? Okay. All right. So this one is. Oh, I'm going to skip this one. We'll come back to that. I'm going to do this one. Hagar and Sarah. So Paul uses a midrash. And I think Paul's <laughs> using a midrash that in his time was more of an argument. When it became written down centuries later in the midrash I'm going to show you, it seems like the rabbis have kind of settled on one of those ideas. But I think Paul is doing something that was well within um, his rights as a rabbi at that time. Hagar and Sarah. So let me do this. Before I get into this book of Galatians, I am in the camp of people like Mark Nanos. I think the, the thrust of the letter of Galatians, and you can argue with me for but not now because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I think the argument is more about two forms of Gentiles joining the synagogue. There are the people who converted to the normal methods which are allowed and, and there for anybody, or the people who become the children of Abraham through faith. And they don't necessarily need to come in 
to the formal conversion. You can see how there would be some contention between those groups. I went through two years of study. I had to get circumcised, and this guy just were equals, and he didn't have to do any of that stuff. You can see it might be a problem. But what Paul is pointing to is a future read of the prophets when the nations turn away, and they grab the seat seat of a Jew, and they say, take us to your God. Right? There's an idea, and Judaism still retains that, that there will be a time when the nations are grafted back in and not everybody is converted. Not everybody holds that view, that view even today. A lot of Jewish groups don't want to convert you. Paul is in a camp where that's not necessary, according to his read of this. Okay, so he lays out this allegory, we could call it a midrash. Two women represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing the children for slavery. She's Hagar. Now, he uses this language, it's strong language, because he wants people to think about the, the commitment they're going to make if they get circumcised. Right? You're going to be, it's going to be problematic for you, not only in the Roman Empire, it's going to be problematic for you because you're going to have to learn all these laws of Torah and keep them. Mount Sinai is the Torah. Um, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, which is under the Torah. She is in slavery with her children. I mean, she has to work and keep that covenant, right? And it's, re it's regretful that he said slavery, but nonetheless, that's where we are. Hagar is the Torah. Jerusalem above is free. She's our mother. That's Sarah we're talking about. And he calls on Isaiah 54. This is a really fascinating midrash. If you read through this in the midrash, you'll see. Sing, O barren one, you who bore no child. Basically, you're going to have tons of children, Sarah. Even though you can't have children, God's going to fulfill his promise. And you're going to have so many kids, they're going to have, you're going to have to expand your tent, as it says in Isaiah. Now, the midrash around that particular passage is really fascinating because it's entirely dealing with converts. The children of Sarah are converts. Wait a minute. You mean not everybody in the congregation are Christians or believers? No. And when Paul visits the, the congregation which the letter of Galatians was written to, uh, Antioch, Pisidia, and Peter, I'm curious where you are on this, a lot of people say that's the, that's the community he wrote to in Galatians. And when he does that, in the book of Acts, he addresses them by three groups, brothers, B'nai Avraham, and God-fearers. So we have three groups of people in this congregation. We have brothers who are Jews, B'nai Avraham, which is still a term for converts today, and we have God-fearers, people who haven't converted who are part of the community. So thankfully in Acts they recorded that because now we know Galatians is talking to two different groups of Gentiles, those who are converted and the ones who haven't converted who feel like they should because they're being told to, and he's saying you don't have to. Okay, so recapping. Hagar, Jerusalem above, children through conversion, Sarah, I'm sorry, Jerusalem below, Jerusalem above, Sarah, children through faith. So these are the people who believe by faith. These are the people who went through the process. All of these are children of Abraham, though, in a sense. All of these are people who came to the community, and they're in the community. There's no reason to change your status. You're good, Paul says. Now, going back to that verse, Isaiah 54, he's, he's talking about Sarah having children. <coughs> In Pesikta Rabati, a much later Midrash, it uses these same verses, and it really, like 33 through 34 and 35, they're pretty long reads. Sing, O barren woman who is not born. Burst out into song, be happy. You did not travail. You didn't have to birth these children, but you have so many children now. And um, you will ask, who got these for me? Like, who gave, who gave us all these children? Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. Right Now, that's from the Gospels. It's a redeemer. And he talks about that. The Messiah is the Redeemer. So the Messiah brought all these children. If you're following the Midrash, Messiah, the Redeemer, brought all of these children to Sarah. Well, who are they? And the Midrash goes on and on about converts, people who walked away from idolatry. And God's judging them. And he says, um, why did you abandon me and worship idols that have no substance? And they will say, Master of the world, if we had come to your door, you wouldn't have accepted us. So the Midrashic tradition around Isaiah 54 is specifically talking about the nations coming in and being a part of Israel and walking away from idolatry. Is it a coincidence that Paul uses that verse and, and does a, an allegory or a Midrash on that? Or was he using what was part of that teaching at that time? And again, um, that's the last one I have for this. It just kind of goes to show that when we look at Galatians, that book is a really challenging book to understand. You, you really need to step back and understand the context of who the audiences are, and the words are in the New Testament. But even if you have that, 
it's still missing something when you see Paul's allegory. And some people come at this as if it's brand new. But the verses he, use, he uses from Isaiah, they have a context in the Midrash. And it's exactly the context he's dealing with. What do we do with these Gentiles who, they shouldn't convert, but they need to be part of the community. So it just goes to show that when you have that Midrash, you can totally pull another read out of those pages. Thank you.